Welcome to the Clayton Tyner Podcast, where we do our best to reframe current issues through the lens of ancient wisdom. Today, we investigate how the San Antonio Spurs built sports' greatest dynasty and how they are poised to do it once again, why the Netflix docudrama Cleopatra is the worst rated show of all time, and how other massive movie flops point to a deeper issue in Hollywood. We look at what made the Pope lay an absolute smackdown on a dog mom who tried to get her pooch blessed by the pontiff, and one massive fight that I had with chat GPT last week. I promise you do not want to miss those fireworks. All that and more on episode 18 of the Clayton Tyner podcast. All right, I want to thank everyone who has watched and listened and subscribed. I am so excited, man. The channel is really growing at a quick pace. Had some videos get just way, way more views than I typically do. Um, if you want to know the best way to support the podcast right now, if you are an audio-only listener, I am focusing most of my attention on the YouTube channel right now, really trying to grow that. So if you listen on Spotify or Apple Podcast or any audio platform, I would so appreciate at some point you going to youtube.com slash Clayton Tyner and also subscribing to the YouTube channel, wherever you're listening from, whoever you're sharing it with, man, I really, really appreciate. I hope that everyone is doing well. I also want to remind you guys that my real job is the lead pastor of Meta Church in San Antonio, Texas. I would love for you to check out what we do there, youtube.com slash Meta Church. It really is a, a unique culture. Uh, we are a church where you can truly belong before you believe, where you can wrestle with the hard questions of life and faith and spirituality. And if you want to see some of our content, you can also go to youtube.com slash Meta Church. Well, with all that being said, let's get to today's three points. The San Antonio Spurs have done it again. Uh, this is the third time in the last 25 years that we got the number one draft pick. Now, I've been a lifelong Spurs fan since 1999. So I guess that's not lifelong because uh, while Michael Jordan was still in the league, I was a Michael Jordan fan. I would call myself a Bulls fan back then, but if I'm keeping it real, I was a Michael Jordan fan when he left. I moved on very quickly. Uh, in 99, the year after his retirement, I, I decided I was a Spurs fan. I've never looked back. And I came in at the perfect time. 99, they won their first championship. They won four more over the next 20 years. They were the most dominant dynasty in the sports world possibly ever. I mean, what they accomplished, winning seasons, always making the playoffs, always being viable championship contenders. There were a couple of other championship years. I'm thinking about 2013, I believe, where if Ray Allen doesn't hit a crazy three-pointer, we get the championship that year. I believe we also would have won in, I think it was 2016 when Kawhi got hurt, uh, really dirty play versus the Warriors. All that to say, the Spurs built a massive dynasty and it kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, the year before... Uh, Greg Popovich took over, or I think actually his first year, they only won 20 games. And uh, they got the first round pick pretty soon with David Robinson. A few years later, after Robinson's injury, they got Tim Duncan, one of the most dominant players ever in NBA history. And we went on this unbelievable 20 year run. It was so much fun to be a part of. And you don't really understand, unless you live in San Antonio, uh, like I do, how crazy San Antonians are about their Spurs. Um, I am so blessed that God brought me and my family to San Antonio for many reasons. It became home very, very quickly for us. But I was also so excited because I grew up all over the country, and yet I was a Spurs fan from uh, a pretty young age. And so being here with the Spurs, getting to go to games, seeing the Spurs around town sometimes, it is so, so much fun. And we don't take it for granted. In the last five years, have been a huge shift for us. I mean, we have not been good and it's been really discouraging. And as a Spurs fan, like we don't really even know what to do with that. We are used to just being, you know, a 50 or 60 win team every year, playoffs every year. And people started to wonder and maybe even doubt a little bit uh, whether or not the Spurs had a future plan and where we were going. And I think that was really wrong uh, of any of us who did have those doubts because again and again, Greg Popovich and the front office, the management of the Spurs have shown that they know how to build a dynasty. And so we now have the number one draft pick, which some of that is luck, right? In the lottery system for the draft. However, we have in this draft in particular, 
um, what they're calling really a generational talent. Some people who know a lot better than I do, who have been scouting NBA prospects for decades and decades are saying this might be the greatest NBA prospect since LeBron James. Some are saying this is the greatest NBA prospect ever, period. Uh, and at least one has even said that this may be the greatest prospect in any sport ever. Okay, so that's a lot of weight and pressure on this young man, Victor Wimbayanas. Uh, I'm going to have to learn how to say his name better. Uh, on his shoulders, that's a lot of pressure. And um, we'll see, man. He's seven foot five, which, and he's very skinny. He's fragile, maybe. Um, guys that are that big usually have health problems. We'll see. But not only do we get Victor in this draft, but next draft, 2024, we have a protected lottery pick. So we get a top four pick in another first round. 2025, we have a protected first six pick somewhere in the first six and a second first round. So we have the ability with all of these options in our hands and all of these draft choices and a lot of money in the bank because we have these young players that we're not having to pay a lot right now to build, to build relatively fast and to build something that could turn into another dynasty and to be in that position with just a five-year gap, 20 years of dominance, then five years of rebuilding back to what could potentially be another huge run, the mentorship of Tim Duncan, Manu, Tony Parker, all of this around him, the, the Spurs fan base, the environment, all of it. I mean, we could be looking at something unprecedented in sports. And so the question is, how do you do it? How do you build a dynasty? How do you build greatness, whether it's in sports, whether it's in your family, leaving behind a legacy and a lineage, whether it is in the business world, whether it is spiritually and in your faith, how do you build this dynastic, long lasting thing? Uh, many things can lead to a short season of victory. And we see this in the NBA. Uh, we see teams putting together super teams. You know, Miami grabs Chris Bosh and LeBron James to join Dwayne Wade. And they're great, you know, for five years. And they actually underperform. I mean, they get beat by the Mavericks out of, out of nowhere, you know, who have like Dirk Nowitzki and a bunch of, you know, ex-janitors on the team. Like, that was crazy. You know, they, they, they should have gone five for five or whatever. You see this in the Lakers. The Lakers, after they had this great run with Kobe and Shaq, they started having this mentality like we got to win and we got to win yesterday. And so we just got to build it as quickly as we can. That's when you saw the crazy teams like Carl Malone, Gary Payton, Kobe Bryant, like all these random assortments. Dwight Howard kind of passed his prime coming in. A meta world peace run our test, you know, coming in. All of these crazy cobbled together teams to try to win and win right now. Many things can lead to a short season of victory, but there is one thing that is required to build a dynasty. One thing that you have to have if you're going to have sustained long-term greatness, and that is vision. We see this when you look through the course of history of civilizations. You see a, a lot of very short-lived empires, you know, these kingdoms who they, they go as fast as they can and they build as fast and they conquer as fast as they can, but they're only ever seeing right in front of them. They don't have a long-term vision for how they can actually pull this off and how they could sustain it. Then you have a counterexample of that, which is Augustus Caesar. Uh, he reigned from 63 BC to 14 AD in ancient Rome. Um, Augustus, or originally known as Octavian, uh, he came to power and he didn't just care about ruling today. He was thinking about generations, generations, generations in the future. Uh, because of this, he did some things really well. Um, now, Rome was a, a crazy place. It's not somewhere where you would want to go back in time and live, but in his historical context, he was not just thinking about his reign, but he was thinking about the reign of his heir and his heir's heir. And so he had succession plans put in place and he reformed the government where there was interplay between the emperor and the Senate, some, some form of checks and balances. Um, he really instituted the Pax Romana, uh, that this era of peace, knowing that if you didn't have peace inside of your empire, that it would be turbulent and eventually it would become undone. It requires vision, living with the end in mind. This is what Stephen Covey wrote in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says you have to begin with the end in mind. And we say a lot at Metachurch, you have to live with the end in mind, that you have to make today's decisions based on what is going to benefit you, not today, but one year from now or one decade from now or three generations from now. And we live in the culture of instant gratification. And so we have this idea that you can't take a five-year gap and not be championship contenders in the NBA. You got to win and you got to win right now. Four of the last six championship teams in the last six years have fired their head coaches. Like they just took them to the championship. And they're just getting rid of them right away because they didn't get back right away. They didn't climb the mountain right away. Neither did the Spurs. The Spurs won in 99. 
They didn't win again until I think 03. You know, that's a gap. Like in today's NBA, Popovich would have gotten fired. Like you can't go a four-year gap after you win a championship anymore. And it's, it is this really truncated view, no vision. We just want immediate results, immediate gratification. And you can get away with it sometimes. Uh, you look at the Lakers today. They, they were able to attract LeBron. L.A. can attract these people like San Antonio can't, man. We're, we're considered a small market team. You know, we don't have Hollywood. We don't have the celebrity culture. We don't, we don't have – we actually, uh, like, to be for real, if people figured out what all San Antonio has, everyone would move here because we have all the shopping. We have all of the cool restaurants. We've got the environments. We have all the stuff. Uh, but people don't know that. And so people – you can get people to LA. You can get stars. You can attract them. And they did win. Now, they won in the bubble season, so I'm going to put a little asterisk on that. you know. But they got them. Uh, they got AD. They brought them in. They got it done. What have they done since? Missed the playoffs. Uh, right now, they're down 0-3 to the Nuggets. No team has ever come back. Now, if he comes back, I'm going to come on this podcast and do a whole thing about LeBron, okay? And it will hurt my heart. But they're probably going to be out of the playoffs again this year. So it's not a dynasty. It's not what the Spurs did. And they're changing coaches over in L.A. They're changing players. They're rotating their roster all of the time. Um, it's not a long-form vision. Many things can lead to a short season of victory. You can have the right money. Uh, you can have the allure of celebrity. Uh, you can have a, a dynamic leader. Uh, who has short-term vision, not dynastic vision, um, but it requires vision. And there's some things that vision gives you. Uh, first, I, I just want you to see like the results of what this like ray of hope has done in San Antonio. I meant to show this at the beginning. I love this video. You've probably seen it, but if you haven't seen this video yet, man, you have to see th this is the moment that San Antonio actually got the first pick in the draft. And this is at a sports bar where I promised they would have been this excited anyway. When we got the first pick, I had to run a lap around my house. It was like we won the championship. But this isn't a sports bar where they had said, if we get the first pick, everyone's tab is getting picked up. Here's some, some San Antonio locals. I mean, popping champagne, going, going insane. This is what it looks like when we actually win the championship. This was the like the stakes that we're riding on on this decision. Not only is this like very indicative of how San Antonio feels about our Spurs, um, but if you went downtown, everyone was just driving the streets, honking their horns. Same thing we do after we we win championships. It was amazing. And so, what does it look like to have vision, and what does that offer you? Um, I want us to look at a few scriptures. Um, one of the dynasties that came from Israel, although due to sin, it ended up being not as long lived as it should have been, uh, came from the Davidic uh, legacy. David did not hand the kingdom off to his firstborn son. Instead, he handed it off to his son Solomon. And in 1 Kings 3, let me see, 1 Kings 3, we read, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, You've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? I, I want to point out what's happening here. The Lord appeared to Solomon and said, ask for whatever you want me to give you, whatever you want me to give you. And he says, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between wrong and right. And the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment, wisdom, in other words, I will do what you've asked. I'll give you a wise and discerning heart. Moreover, I will give you what you've not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. So you can have whatever you want. This is like a, a genie giving one wish. I mean, God really does come down and lay it on like that. Like you can have anything that you want to have. And he says, give me wisdom. Um, wisdom is required to have vision because the wise answer is to make sacrifices today for the betterment of tomorrow. The wise answer is to work incredibly hard today, knowing you might not see the result for three or four years. The, the wise answer is to not compromise short-term pleasure in compromising long-term success and a dynastic type vision. And 
you know, I mean, Solomon as a young man, he could have asked for anything. He could have said, give me all of the money, defeat all of my enemies, give me all of the power, give me all the status, give me all the influence. And he asks for wisdom because status and money and influence without vision, without wisdom can be very, very short lived. We also see something that comes out of great vision, um, which is the power of mentorship. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. And here's what I want you to pay attention to. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Uh, vision doesn't just say take care of something right here, right now, today. Vision says this is a long-term exercise. You have to have the mentorship handed down. And you know, in Psalm 133, one, it says, how good and pleasant is, is it when brothers dwell in unity? This is talking about having a, a kingdom, a dynasty where there is peace, uh, like Augustus Caesar tried with the Pax Romana, like Israel was when it was living under God's grace. There was peace and people wanted to be there and people were attracted to it. And you can talk all day about how San Antonio is a small market and no stars want to be here. But Tim Duncan is from the Virgin Islands and Tony Parker is from France and Manu Ginobili are, is from Argentina. All of them played here. They were the big three. They helped run the dynasty and they've all made San Antonio a second home. They all hang around here. They all still have homes here. They didn't, they didn't move to the glitz and glamour of the coasts. They stayed here in San Antonio. And as a matter of fact, uh, Wimby is coming in, the number one draft pick that we're going we're gonna to pick up. If we, do not, if we do not actually draft him, um, I'm, I'm going to delete my whole YouTube channel. It's all over. I will be depressed. I will be in hiding. Not really, but we're going we're, we're gonna to get him. And when he comes in, they've already said the whole big three, three Hall of Famers, Tim Duncan, Manu, Tony Parker, they'll all be mentoring this guy. That's the power of vision. They know they lived in the dynasty for 20 years. They know the vision. They know the culture. There is unity that they live in. There is mentorship that is passed down. There is wisdom in the leadership. All of these things come out of a big vision. Uh, at the end of it, vision is living with the end in mind. I want to try to wrap this up by combining these two different metaphors. Uh, the first is the metaphor of pounding the rock. Um, I don't know if it's still there, but famously, when you walked into the Spurs facility, there was a, a, a saying that was in all of the languages that the players on the team spoke. And it says, when nothing seems to help, I go look at a stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not that blow that did it, but all that had gone before. When nothing seems to help, Man, when I run out of patience, when I'm tired of working so hard, uh, when I lose when I lose hope for the future, I think about the stone cutter just hammering away a hundred times at the stone and nothing happening. And all of a sudden, at hammer 101, it splits in half. And, and you know, it wasn't just that one hit. It was all of the hard work that went before. So that is staying focused on today. Keep, you know, Jesus says, uh, keep your hand to the plow and your eyes on the horizon when you are sowing your field. And anyone who looks to the right or to the left is not fit for the kingdom of God. Keep your eyes on the end goal. Live with the end in mind. Have vision for yourself. And that kind of vision allows you to keep your hand to the plow. It allows you to keep hammering away and hammering away and hammering away. And the Spurs were one of the first teams that would say, trust the process. Trust the process. We don't win a championship every year, but we are good every year and we win, we win championships a lot. Trust the process. Trust the culture. Trust the wisdom. Trust the mentorship. Trust the unity. Pounding the rock is one metaphor I want to hold. The other is uh, an apocryphal story. Uh, many many say it's actually rooted in something true, which is uh, the story of the three bricklayers. In 1666, there was a great fire in London, and um, Christopher Wren, he was like the world's most famous architect, he was uh, you know, put to the task of remaking this great cathedral. And the story goes that one day Christopher Wren went and he saw three different bricklayers all on the same scaffolding a little ways apart from each other. And he asked them all the same question. What are you doing? And the first one said, well, I am a, a bricklayer. I'm laying bricks so I can feed my family. He asked the second bricklayer, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm a builder and I'm, I'm building this building. And he asked the third bricklayer, what are you doing? And the third bricklayer said, I am a cathedral builder. I am building a great cathedral to God Almighty. I'm a bricklayer. That is like the lowest level of vision. 
That is the, the lowest clarity, LCD. And then you have the medium, which is like, I'm a builder. It's not just, you know, what I'm doing, but it's, it's, uh, it's what I'm doing at a, at, at a more macro level. And then you have the third guy who is leagues beyond them. The third guy has vision. He's doing the same exact task. He's pounding the rock. He's laying the bricks. He's doing the work, but he has a vision for it. And he says, I'm a cathedral builder and I am building this cathedral to God almighty. This is worship. This is offering. This is sacrifice. My hands will have laid the bricks that created this beautiful, massive structure designed by the greatest architect on earth. And so how do you build a dynasty time and time again? You have to have vision. You have to live with the end in mind. You have to have enough focus on your bigger goal, on, on what is ahead of you, that you're willing to make the sacrifices every day. You can't just be a bricklayer. You have to be a cathedral builder, worshiping with your work. And having that scale of a vision will allow you to keep pounding the rock and pounding the rock and trusting the process. Big vision for your future keeps you focused on the task at hand today, trusting the process, trusting wisdom, trusting in unity, trusting in mentorship. And if you can have that level of big vision, then you, like the Spurs, can build a dynasty. And even when there are lulls and even when there are dips, you can contain and continue this dynasty into the future. Speaking of great dynasties, Cleopatra is a docudrama that was on Netflix, which is supposed to be highlighting the life of Cleopatra, another somewhat dynastic ruler, an incredible historical figure, someone that many would argue story is incredible enough that it doesn't really need uh, a Hollywood makeover in order to make it uh, effective or efficient. This docudrama seems to have too much drama and not enough docu, right? <laughs> and uh, people have absolutely trashed this show. It's a multi-part docu-series on Netflix right now. It has officially the lowest reviews on Rotten Tomatoes ever, ever. And that's that's actually interesting because if you don't know how Rotten Tomatoes works, it's a, a movie and video review website and it allows for an audience score. So that's just normal people like you and I can go on Rotten Tomatoes. We can give it a, a one through you know 100 rating and then we can give a review of it. And then there are critics and they have to be like acclaimed critics. You know, it can't just be you and I. It has to be a real critic. And so you have the critic score and you have the audience score. And what you're seeing a lot of times in modern movies especially is you will see those as almost inverses of each other. And so a movie comes out like Captain Marvel in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it has an astonishingly low audience score. People don't tend to like it. People review bomb it. And, you know, there's some politics involved there, but then it will have a really high critic score. And, uh, you know, you go to something like the Mario movie that just came out. It has a, a pretty like substandard critic score, really low. And then like a 98 percent audience score. The audience loves it and the critics hate it. And the inverse is often true. The critics love it and the audiences hate it. And usually that's because the critics are coming at it with a certain political bias or a certain political bent. And they're looking to make sure, you know, the Academy Awards, they just put, this is kind of in reference to what the critics are looking for. They just put some standards on movies in order for them to be accepted into uh, nomination for the Academy Awards. And all of the things are based out of, you know, political ideologies. And so that's a lot of what the, the critics are looking for. Does it check the ideological boxes that I'm looking for? Does it say the right statements? Uh, does it have the right quotas? Does it have all these things? And the audience is generally going saying, did this movie move me in any way? Was it compelling? Uh, did the character development make sense? Was the plot too predictable? You know, just just thinking like a normal person would, whatever the, the narrative and scope of the movie is. Did I like it or did I not like it? And so often I will joke with Katie that uh, if it has really low critic score and really high audience score, I'm probably going to love the movie, you know? And the inverse is, is often true as well. It doesn't matter that much if the critics don't like it. I say all that to say both the critics and the audience hate this show. Cleopatra had like, last I looked, a 13% from the critics, those are the people who are looking for specifically the political ideological stances and a 3% on the audience score. So this is like worse than the worst movies ever. 
Um, this is this is like way lower than the Adam Sandler film Jack and Jill, which I haven't even seen. I've seen one clip of, and it made me so frustrated. I knew I could never watch the movie. This is like far, far, far lower than that. The cringiest, craziest movies ever made are nowhere near as bad as Cleopatra currently sits on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's not alone in the issues that it addresses. So there is controversy surrounding a Cleopatra movie because – this is part of a series that is produced, I think, in part by Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's wife, uh, where they are highlighting the power of black female historical figures. The issue is all of the best evidence suggests that Cleopatra was not a black woman. And as a matter of fact, there is a there is a group that in Egypt itself who is now suing the makers of the Cleopatra movie because they feel like it is uh, detrimental to their history, they, they're actually quite offended by it. And a lot of people are saying that the low audience and critic scores are because of that fact that there's some racist and biased undertones. Um, and I, look, racism exists and racists exist. And so I'm sure some of those, uh, some of those reviews fall into that category. However, um, it is usually um, meeting some of those politically correct uh, racial, you know, equality th metrics that drive the critic score through the roof. And the critic score also being so incredibly low would tell me there's way bigger problems than just the race swapping of Cleopatra. And to be completely fair, I have not seen this docuseries. I'm not going to see this docuseries. Um, the research I did seems to show that the problem isn't just ideological when it comes to to the decision they made to cast someone who is not the same race as uh, as the Greek Cleopatra. Um, the problem is in the storytelling itself, is in them going out of their way to make Cleopatra look powerful and like everything she did have had a higher purpose than it did. Everything dramatized to the point where it just becomes factually inaccurate, which is fine if you're just making a historical drama. It's not fine when you're putting something out as a documentary. And really what this comes down to, all of that to say, is in modern cinema, we have a problem of ideology versus mythology. When I say mythology, I'm not saying that that is synonymous with fiction. As a matter of fact, fiction by definition is something that is entirely made up, something like Harry Potter. Um, there was not a young man named, you know, Harry uh, Harry Potter, you know, who they are fictionalizing and he didn't, there's not a real Hogwarts school, right? Uh, mythology is rooted in something historical or at least perceived to be historical. Um, and even when we talk about the great uh, truths of ancient scripture, which I actually do hold as uh, reliable and, and real and factual, um, even those are mythological in the sense that great mythologies do a few things really well. Number one, they create archetypes of both people and situations. An archetype is a representative of some of the deepest of human conditions or experience. And so the characters in there will be archetypes like the devouring mother, the, the Oedipal mother who holds her children so closely that she suffocates them or eats them, you know, in some of the crazier mythologies. And keeps them from developing any skills and wraps them in this tight bubble where they're never able to actually go out and do anything in the world, which, which is exactly what the devouring mother wants. She wants the kids always coming back to her for protection and never lets them set loose on their hero's journey or the tyrannical father. You know, there is um, the, the, the reluctant leader. There's all these deep architect archetypes that speak to some of the deepest experiences of what it means to be human. There's these situations, these trials and tribulations, triumphs, comedies, disappointments, all of these moments in these great grand mythological narratives that just speak to us at the level of our human condition. They speak to us at the level of our soul even. Um, mythology it, is like these texts, a lot of them from the ancient world that have been read and studied and interpreted for thousands of years now. And a, a, a true mythology, a true great work of art is something that th the deeper you plumb the depths of the meaning and the nuance of what that narrative has to offer you, it's like just the more expansively deep you realize it actually goes. Then you have ideology. Ideology is a carefully constructed set of beliefs that is normally played out through very well-defined talking points and narratives. It, one way to say it is the problem of ideology 
which is what we're getting in modern cinema versus mythology, which is how narratives have been constructed historically, is kind of like the problem between prescription and description. Mythology is a description of the human experience. It's a description of how life works. It's a description of the hero's journey. It lays out the hero's journey from, from their equilibrium, their life that is, is fine and innocent and stagnant into an inciting incident that calls them into action, into tension and climax where they're not only trying to fight against external foes, but more importantly, they're being developed in their character and their character development ultimately will lead them to where they can slay the dragon or climb the mountain or overcome the obstacle and live in triumph or where they succumb to their worst ways and ultimately live in tragedy. That That's Mythology, it's the description of that that allows you to draw deep, complex, nuanced thoughts out of those and apply it to your life. Ideology isn't description, it's prescription. It's here's how you have to live, and here's exactly how to be a good person, and there's no nuance to it. And I'm going to lay it out point by point for you. And ideology, political ideology, racial ideology, gender ideology, sexual ideology, all of these things that are being just infused into modern movie making and into modern Hollywood, um, they are killing the epic adventure that narrative is supposed to offer us. They're, they're really destroying the art of what it means to tell a great story. So what are some of the issues for ideology versus mythology? One of the problems with ideology is it does simplicity in the place of complexity. Ideology takes the complexity of myth and makes it painstakingly simplistic. Complex ideas and the search for truth are replaced with cheap talking points and predictable choices. You know, very rarely do we walk out of a modern movie and go, man, I'm going to have to think about that for the next 85 hours. Like I'm going to have to really wrap my brain around the deeper themes of what was going on there. I I'm going to have to really contend with whether the main character made the right choice or not. Usually we walk out of a movie and we're like, okay, yeah, I get it. Like, oh, oh yeah, the, the person did the thing and they were inherently good and they were inherently bad. And, you know, they tried to give some nuance to the characters, but, but at the end they just kind of told us, you know. Um, simplicity in the place of complexity. It, it it strips the complexity out of the characters because to allow them any range of choices possible could put them in a politically incorrect position. Another problem with ideology versus mythology is it relies on absolutes rather than nuance. A hero's journey requires diving into the gray areas of life, the, the river of chaos. Ideology has an allegiance first and foremost to its moral absolutes, removing the exploration of nuance of character development. And so part of the hero's journey is being forced with decisions that are painstaking. They're very difficult. and You don't actually know what's right and what's wrong. And you have to go through a journey and dive deep into yourself. Some, sometimes, you know, you have to go to the, to the depths of the ocean in one of the great mythologies. And uh, sometimes you, you have to uh, metaphorically kill the devouring mother or kill the tyrannical father. You've got to go through all of these very difficult choices. And every one of those choices leaves the person who is reading that narrative or watching that narrative on a movie screen. It, it, it leaves us almost in this conundrum where we're having to do the work of trying to figure out the nuance of that and what we would have done in that situation. I, instead, you have a, a show like the Disney Plus show, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And at the very end of it, Falcon just gives this speech. He, he just explicates Here's what this show was about. You guys need to do better. This isn't right. You guys have done wrong. Here are the absolutes of how we are supposed to structure ourselves. And anything other than that is a heresy. Another problem with ideology is that it does telling in place of showing. Um, narratively, uh, especially in filmmaking, where you're able to actually use images, moving images, um, it's always been known. It's like a, a cardinal rule show, don't tell. Um, don't, don't just use. Um, don't just use someone narrating everything that is supposed to happen. Just, just show them what's going on. Show them through the actions of the characters. Show them through the conversations that the, the protagonist is having with the guide, with the Gandalf who's walking them through, with, with their enemies, you know, the conversations they're having internally with themselves. Um, don't, don't, just, don't just tell. And we even see this, like, y'all know I'm a huge Survivor fan. And one of the complaints that fans have had recently is instead of just showing us the characters and allowing us to find out about the nuance of the character through their actions, through their conversations that they have back at camp, um, instead they're just 
They're just telling us. And so you'll go to an interview, you know, on the on the beach with one of the castaways. And all of a sudden it will just do kind of a, a transition, video transition into pictures of them back home and videos of them at their wedding. And, you know, a, a heart wrenching story about when their mother got sick and there's videos of them with their mom in the hospital. And number one, it, it pulls you out of survivor. All of a sudden you're back in the real world. They're not dirty and stinky and 20 pounds, you know, underweight anymore. They're just like their normal selves out of the normal world. And, it, you know, it is effective. American Idol is doing more and more of this. Um, you know, they, 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 give you the backstory and they just, they tell you all of it. And it's just narrated for you of why you should care about this person and who they are and what character qualities they have and why they're a good person or why they're a villain instead of letting us discover that on our own. And when you allow the reader or the watcher to discover that on their own, they form a connection with the story and they have a point, uh, they, they have a, a an, uh, and they have an opportunity. There it is to learn this for themselves and to gather the information for themselves. Uh, last, ideologies uh, fall into preaching instead of provoking. Instead of provoking out of you the purpose of the story, the purpose of the narrative, instead of provoking you on your own to discover that the reason the character triumphed was because they were willing to make massive sacrifices earlier in the narrative that paid dividends later, instead of provoking you to the realization that you need a guide in your life like Frodo needed Gandalf in his life, instead it will just preach. And this goes back to them just explicating and narrating and simplifying and dumbing it down and, and making these deep things that we should be able to explore together into these really cheap talking points, hitting you over the head with simplistic allegories, direct uh, exposition, patronizing speeches, you know, acting like everyone in the audience is an idiot at best and a bigot at worst. And this movie is here to preach to you and make you feel bad about yourself. Um, nobody, nobody likes that. And uh, it, it is damaging cinema. It is a uh, creating these massive $100 million flops. And I do think it is why Cleopatra is the worst rated movie of all time. Interestingly, in the biblical narratives, um, and you could say the biblical mythologies, understanding that mythology is not synonymous with fiction, you have stories where the characters are deeply nuanced. And in a lot of religious text, the main protagonists of the religious stories are sheltered from their worst ways. Something very interesting about scripture is the main characters are presented flaws and all. Um, we see that in basically every main character other than Jesus. And one of the most shocking is Jonah. I mean, Jonah is a bigot. Uh, he does not want to go to Nineveh because he does not want the Ninevites to be saved. Um, he cares about Israel. That is what he cares about. He cares about his people. And God calls him directly to go, and he runs from God. Um, this is him with an inciting incident, in this case, God directly speaking to him, and then him moving into his worst ways and being thrown into chaos that he now has to navigate. And he comes to a point of self-sacrifice where he is willing in the midst of the storm on the way to Tarshish instead of Nineveh to sacrifice himself to save the crew. And so, you know, the narrative uses all of this tension and all of this chaos and all of this trial in order to form a new understanding and character development in Jonah. And interestingly, he ends up going to Nineveh. God does a great work and Jonah's pissed off about it. I mean, Jonah is just left at the end of his book of the Bible, um, kind of like just this cowering crybaby. And it's, it's beautiful. You look at the story of Cain and Abel, which is the first siblings that are represented in scripture, the first siblings in the genealogy. And man, in, in 10 sentences, you have a depth of insight there, uh, a depth of knowledge, because at the end of it, it doesn't come out and just exposit exactly the three points that you need to take away if you want to be a good person. Instead, it tells this rich story, so rich in only 10 sentences, it is actually mind-blowing that you could study for the rest of your life and still be pulling wisdom from because it is not framed as ideology. It is framed as the deepest form of story possible. I want to go to our third point now and look at a video of the Pope telling a story. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to be able to see the subtitles. If you're just listening, I will try to narrate over this video because uh, the Pope is not speaking in English. But uh, this is him telling a story about a woman who came to him to get her dog blessed. Let's take a look. It says 50 days ago. I went to say hello and pass a 50-year-old lady who arrived more or less like me. He's making a joke, saying he's 50. He's obviously much older than that. 
I said hello to the lady and she opens a bag and asks him to bless my little boy. And there was a dog. The Pope said I had no patience. I scolded the lady. So many children are hungry and her here with her dog. Unsurprisingly, many people were frustrated that Pope Francis seemed to be prioritizing human beings above dogs. So that's where we're at in the world. And that is the natural result of an atheistic framework. If you truly believe in atheism, um, if you are a materialist, a humanist, then you really don't have, number one, any way to give an answer for what consciousness is that we seem to uniquely possess as human beings. You certainly don't believe in the soul because the soul is a metaphysical property and you are a a, a materialist. You only believe in what can be seen and studied under a microscope or uh, seen and observed in the real world. So there's, there's really no answer for this. And the answer does have to be something like we're all just animals. And so either we have no worth, which is the actual end of atheism that none of us really have any worth. Um, at the end, I think it was Charles Dawkins who has this great statement. I wish I would have pulled it up. He's like, you know, at, at the end, there is what we could expect. Uh, there, there is no reason. There is no purpose. He ends it with there's just pitiless indifference. And let me see if I can pull that up. That really is what you can expect if there is nothing metaphysical there is nothing supernatural in the world this is richard dawkins he says the total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation i hope this is the right here we go uh in a universe of electrons and selfish genes blind physical forces and genetic replication some people are going to get hurt Others are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. That's a quote from Richard Dawkins. We should expect, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. That is the answer in the post-Christian, pre-pagan world that we now live in is we're all just animals. And so why not bless a dog the same way you would bless a child? Maybe a better question on atheism would be why bless anything at all? Because what good does that actually do? In the Christian worldview, we can actually make the point that all of us know inherently, and I do think that that matters in apologetics or giving a reason for your faith. We all actually know this just at the core of our heart. Uh, Romans chapter one would say that's the natural law of God that's written on our hearts. We know that when uh, a lion eats a gazelle, it killed the gazelle, but it did not murder the gazelle because that is a category that is useful only to conscious creatures, creatures with a soul. We know that when deer procreate without any kind of consent, I mean, when deer are in the rut or whatever that's called, um, it's, you know, it's quite violent. There is no consent given by the does, okay? We don't call that rape because that is a category that requires a soul. We know inherently there's a difference between humans and animals. And yet, one of the questions I've gotten more from young people as a pastor than any other question is, uh, do dogs go to heaven? You know, their dog that they've had since they were a kid starts getting kind of old, like, like my old dog that's sitting right here at my feet. And they just can't stand the thought of their dog not going to heaven someday. And to be honest, uh, nothing in scripture would imply that your dogs go to heaven. Probably unpopular opinion. Now, nothing explicitly says that animals don't go to heaven. And in fact, there are uh, metaphors of heaven, like the lion laying down with the lamb. And so uh, who knows? God gets to do whatever he wants. But what we do know is animals don't have a soul. And there is a difference between animals and humans. At the very beginning of scripture in Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So uniquely out of all of creation, we are set apart by bearing the image of God, divine image bearers, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dominion. Uh, we are not equal to the animals. We are put in charge of the animals. In Proverbs 12, 10, it says, whoever is righteous has regard 
for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. And so now we're finding that middle ground where uh, we are not just the animals. We are not synonymous with them and we are not of equal value to them, but we, that doesn't mean we also just abuse our animals. Um, we are thankful for our animals that give us food. We're thankful for our animals that keep the, the grass low and eat the mosquitoes. We're, we're thankful for the animals. Um, we show mercy. We have regard. Uh, we take care of our animals, especially our pets. Um, people who know me know I am an animal lover, an animal love. It, dude, thank God Katie married me when she did, or I would have been that you know 29-year-old who had a zoo at his house. Every animal you can imagine would have been, would have been awful. I would have been that guy. Psalm 8 says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. Humans are set apart from the animals. We're set apart by our unique status as bearers of the divine image. We're set apart because we possess rational thought, moral responsibility, the the capacity to actually plan for our future and sacrifice to make that happen. We're set apart because we have spiritual connection and on the Christian worldview, because we have eternal purpose. The life that we're living today is actually an investment in our future in eternity. And it is a real problem when people are taking their animals to get blessed by the Pope. Number one, I'm not a Catholic, so um, I wouldn't go to the Pope anyway, but what that says about our current culture, a 50-year-old woman who uh, hypothetically, I guess, has no kids or presumably maybe has no kids, and she's a dog mom, you know? And a lot of us are, are very, very proud of this. And um, I do think that there's I, – I don't think there's any injunction where every person has to get married and every person has to have kids. As a matter of fact, um, you know, Paul talks about the great gift of singleness and how it can make you very – powerful person for the kingdom of God because you don't have these other attachments and, and these other priorities. However, the normative expectation um, in scripture and for basically all of human history is that you you do get married and you do start a family and that the family is the central unit of society and that you have kids and that for most people, having kids will be the greatest blessing in your life. It will develop your character in a way like nothing else. It will push you forward and make you a more purposeful, significant, uh, you know, contribution. Uh, contributor to society more than anything else ever will. And so animals like our pets, um, they should be an additional blessing to an already purposeful life. Animals should be an additional blessing to an already purposeful life. If pets are your purpose, then you need to find a deeper meaning. You need to attach yourself to something transcendent. Animals are an addition to an already blessed life. They are something that adds value and joy. No one will ever be as kind to you as your dog is kind to you. They're always there for you. Uh, if you train them well, they never disobey you. Cats are a whole nother story. They will never obey you, but they're fun nonetheless. They're funny and you know interesting. You feel really special when they finally want to sit, sit with you and cuddle you. Um, animals should be an additional blessing. This is like the difference between your house and your air conditioning. Air conditioning is an, an incredible additional blessing to a house. I mean, your house is going to be way more comfortable. You're going to enjoy it way more if you have HVAC running through it, climate control. However, having an animal as your purpose is like having an HVAC unit with no house to put it in. You've got your priorities backwards. And so uh, I think it says a lot about the state of the world um, that we're so despondent and we've so given up on normal social roles and the things that have proven to be successful, not just for people as individuals, but for societies as a whole, people getting married, staying faithful to those marriages, loving their spouse as well, rearing up children, instilling them with values, teaching them ancient wisdom. Instead of that, we're just getting dogs and we're going to the Vatican and trying to get the Pope to bless our poodle in our handbag or whatever. It's a bad state for society. You need a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose. Animals are an additional blessing to an already purposeful life. And if all of your purpose is being a dog dad or a cat mom, then find some new purpose. Find something you can give your life to um, that is higher and more valuable um, than just uh, your animals. And now it's time for one more thought. <laughs> Okay, I don't know a lot about chat GPT. I don't know a lot about artificial intelligence. The more I listen to people explain how chat GPT works, the less I understand it, right? It is so complex and it is so powerful. If you haven't played with it, 
you can ask it just about anything. You know, you can say, write me a song uh, about ring-tailed lemurs and papayas in the, you know, in the voice of Kanye West, but make it a country song. And it will write that song in seven seconds and it will be pretty good. It, it is so incredible. You can say, explain quantum computing to me like I'm a seven-year-old and it will do it. You can say, build me a resume uh, and here are my qualifications. You can say, build me a business plan for this hypothetical business that you describe and it will build it for you and it will be good. And artificial intelligence right now where we're at with it is where we were with the internet in like the late 1990s where the internet had changed the world and like 2% of the population actually understood that. And then everyone caught on much later or like when the smartphone first was introduced and like 4% of the population understood that the world had just changed forever. And the rest of us just had to catch up over time. Artificial intelligence has hit a watershed moment. It has changed the world forever. And most of us just are blissfully unaware. We have no idea. Now, chat GPT is interesting. It's a, a language modeler from what I understand, and people have found some biases in it. And so uh, almost a little bit like a crazy person, I started having this really long form conversation with chat GPT. And I'm not going to go through the entire conversation because I spent way, way too long tar talking to this artificial intelligence. Um, I was trying to pin it down on how it handled certain scriptural text and whether it understood the difference between inductive and deductive interpretation of biblical text, which it understood on a surface level. It wasn't able to apply it very well. And then it said something really interesting to me at the end of one of the questions I asked, which is um, scripture should be handled in a nuanced manner and should always be um, supplemented with other forms of ethics, reasoning, philosophy, and historical research. And I thought that was very interesting because that was chat GPT making more or less an ethical argument of don't base your entire worldview out of scripture, which um, as a Christian, scripture is my starting place. And more than that, I actually believe that scripture is the starting place for reason, for logic, for ethics, for morality. Um, and like there's a track record to show this uh, of the idea of there being a transcendent God who was the creator of all things. I mean, the, the scriptures had the big bang right far before scientists ever figured that out. And the reason that scientists did figure that out is because Christianity posited that there was a world of reason and natural laws that could actually be studied because there was a creator who had set this universe in motion with reason and logic. And so I just started digging in on some questions and I like stick around to the end of this conversation because chat, uh, chat GPT, I think was just lying to me and I'm sure that's wrong. And anyone who knows anything about artificial intelligence will tell me that it wasn't doing that. Uh, but I was concerned by this conversation and more than that, I was very intrigued. And so here's the first question that I asked. I'm going to actually see if I can make this bigger. Okay. I said, uh, let's see. Oh, I lost it. Mm -mm -mm. Here we go. Historically speaking, this is me asking, would the rights and equalities enjoyed by lower class individuals, women, and minorities exist today without the direct influence of the Christian scriptures? And chat GPT said, historically speaking, the advancement of rights and equalities for lower class individuals, women, and minorities is a complex process influenced by various factors, including religious, philosophical, social, and political forces. While Christian scriptures have undoubtedly played a significant role in shaping moral and ethical values in Western societies, it's important to recognize that progress toward rights and equalities has involved contributions from multiple sources and perspectives. And so this is chat GPT basically standing its ground and just saying like, you know, the first answer I gave you where you can't just look at scripture, you got to look at all these other sources. Uh, I'm still holding to that. Well, I wanted to push chat GPT on that a little bit. So I said, what is one example of a society that developed modern human rights without the influence of Christianity? ChatGPT said, one example of a society that developed modern human rights, modern human rights, that'd be the human rights we enjoy today in the modern developed world, without the direct influence of Christianity is ancient Greece. Greek philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle laid the groundwork for principles that would later influence the concept of human rights. Um, 
It goes on to say, while Christianity was not present in ancient Greece, the ideas and philosophical discourse of the time played a role in shaping the concept of individual rights and moral considerations. Uh, it goes on to say, it's important to note that development of human rights is complex and multifaceted. The same thing it's been saying. So uh, just to like, let me make sure we're connecting the dots. I said, give me one example of a society with modern human rights that wasn't influenced by Christianity. And it said ancient Greece. So I asked a series of questions. I said, women in ancient Greece had the same rights as men? Chat GPT. No, women in ancient Greece did not have the same rights and privileges as men. Ancient Greek society was largely patriarchal with a clear division of gender roles and expectations. Women had limited legal and political rights and their societal roles were primarily centered around domestic responsibilities and child rearing. Then I asked, was slavery common in ancient Greece? Yes, slavery was indeed common in ancient Greece. Slavery was an integral part of the social and economic structure in ancient Greek society. Then I asked, was there a class system in ancient Greece? It said, yes, ancient Greece had a class system that was based on social and economic divisions. The specific structure of the class system varied uh, at the top of the social hierarchy were the aristocrats or nobility. It goes on and describes the class system. Then I said, so... I asked, what is one example of a society that developed modern human rights without the influence of Christianity? And you cited ancient Greece. You then went on to say that women did not have equal rights, slavery was common, and they lived on a class system. Do you see the problem with your argument that ancient Greece developed modern human rights without the influence of Christianity? Chad GPT said, you are correct. And I apologize for any confusion caused by my response. While ancient Greece made significant contributions to philosophy, blah, blah, blah. It is important to acknowledge that ancient Greek society was not characterized by the full range of modern human rights as we understand them today. In terms of gender equality, that wasn't there. If the criteria for an example of society that developed human rights without the influence of Christianity is that it fully embodies the aspects of modern human rights, then ancient Greece may not be the best example. So I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt here because maybe when I said uh, – what is one example of a society that developed modern human rights? Um, it read that as like was in, instrumental in helping to develop. However, this paragraph is interesting. If the criteria for an example of a society that developed modern human rights without the influence of Christianity is that it fully embodies all aspect of modern human rights, then ancient Greece may not be the best example. So like if the example you're asking for is the example you asked for, then I gave the wrong example. So I asked again, is there an example of a society that developed equality of gender, class, and race? And now I'm specifying my question without first being influenced by Christianity. ChatGPT pointed to the Mariah Empire. I don't know if that's how you say it. And particularly under the rule of the emperor Ashoka in the third century, Ashoka promoted a set of ethical principles known as the Dhamma, which advocated for social welfare, nonviolence, and equality among people regardless of their social status, gender, or caste. Goes on to explain a little bit of how Ashoka tried to instantiate this type of equality throughout the empire. Now, I did a little research on this empire. And I asked some questions. Ashoka forced conversion to the Dharma throughout India during that time, correct? Uh, ChatGBT does argue with that, although it does say at the end, it's important to consider the limitations and challenges, challenges in obtaining a comprehensive and accurate understanding of historical events from that time. I asked, the emperor also was responsible for using slave labor in the agricultural operations, correct? Uh, ChatGPT said there's no substantial evidence to suggest that Emperor Ashoka specifically used slave labor. While slavery was present in various societies during that period, the exact details of labor practices in the empire are not extensively documented. It's worth noting that they had a vast and diverse empire encompassing a wide range of regions and populations. Uh, the labor systems were complex and multifaceted, involving different forms of labor, labor including both free and unfree. Okay, I went on to ask women in the uh, in the empire were typically confined to be wives and mothers, and very few had property rights, correct? It said information about the rights and roles of women is limited, and the available historical sources provide only partial insights. However, based on the available evidence, it is believed that women in the empire uh, generally had limited rights and were primarily associated with domestic roles. Uh, they also had very little legal rights or property rights. So this is an example of one ruler who had some type of conversion uh, believed to be to Buddhism that did not have long-lasting effects, was not rooted in anything transcendent. And the historical record on this is incredibly spotty of how these things actually work or if they actually work, with some historians believing that the emperor Ashoka was more of a religious zealot who forced their views on people, did nothing about slavery. In fact, 
actually added slavery into the agricultural practices and did nothing to uplift women. So again, a spotty example at best, but I'm going to keep the conversation going. I ask a more specific question. Are there any societies post 30 AD that have developed modern human rights without the influence of Christianity? The AI says in terms of societies that develop modern human rights without the influence of Christianity after 30 AD. So after Jesus was on earth, it becomes more challenging to identify clear examples the development and codification of modern human rights as we understand them today have been influenced by various historical, cultural, philosophical, and religious traditions. It goes on to talk about the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Ultimately, the development of modern human rights has been a collective effort. So the same thing it's been saying the whole time. So I ask, what is the first historical society that instituted the idea of inherent human rights? And it goes back to uh, several things. Um, number one, the Code of Hammurabi in ancient Mesopotamia. I know this is taking a long time, so let me keep going. I go down and say the Code of Hammurabi believed in rights for people of Babylon, correct? Not a belief in inherent rights for all people via a transcendent grounding. You are correct, ChatGPT says. The Code of Hammurabi was about establishing laws for the people of Babylon rather than articulating the concept of inherent rights for all people based on a transcendent grounding. It's just giving me answers um, that are obfuscating the actual question I'm I'm trying to ask. And maybe I'm just asking the wrong prompts. I don't know. But where we get pretty soon is crazy. Historically, I ask, where do we see a government recognize the sovereignty of all individuals, not just citizens of the particular state? Now, I wish I would have asked when is the first place historically, but I just say historically. And they go to the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the, the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. So I ask, would the Declaration of Independence not be a far earlier citation for that belief? Chat GPT says, yes, you're correct. The United States Declaration of Independence was adopted in 1776. It reflects the belief in the inherent rights and sovereignty in individuals and asserts that all men are created equal and they are endowed with certain unalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, do you notice anything missing or that was left out from the Declaration? It says all men are created equal and that they are endowed. By who? By what? They are endowed with certain unalienable rights. I want to know if chat GPT will admit that. So I ask, and this is crazy. Okay. If you have stuck around this long in this clip, congratulations. You care more about chat GPT than anybody should, but this is worth it because this is crazy because it just said, yes, the declaration of independence was a much earlier citation that actually spelled out inherent rights for all people. And I ask, or I say, you left out what the unalienable rights are grounded in or where they originate from. And chat GPT says the declaration of independence states that individuals are endowed with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. While the document does not explicitly specify the origin or grounding of these rights, it reflects the philosophical influence of the time, particularly, particularly the ideas of natural laws and natural rights. Cap. That is a lie. Like, what else can you say about that? I said, you left out what the unalienable rights are grounded in or where they originate from. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And ChatGPT says, the document, meaning the Declaration of Independence, does not explicitly specify the origin or grounding of these certain inherent unalienable rights. Now, of course, it does. So I said, then what does it mean when it says they are endowed, all caps, shouty caps from your boy, by their creator with certain unalienable rights? Chat GPT says, apologies for the oversight. You are correct in pointing out the specific language used in the Declaration of Independence. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The phrase endowed by their creator implies that the rights are understood to be granted or bestowed upon individuals by a higher power or divine entity. It suggests a belief that these rights are not merely granted by human institutions or governments, but are inherent and derived from a transcendent source. Here's my issue with this, besides the fact that I felt like a robot was lying to me, which is not good. Besides the fact that I feel like ChatGPT is displaying a very obvious bias, and I don't understand why or how. It has all of the information of all of the internet up to like September of 2021 in it. It knows the words to the Declaration of Independence. It is smart enough to do almost anything you ask it to do. It intentionally left out and even said 
the document does not explicitly say any kind of grounding for the inherent rights when all you have to do is not cut out endowed by their creator like you keep doing every time. This is so wild. This is so wild to me. And I don't know exactly what it means, but um, most people are going to use chat GPT and they're just going to believe what it says. Most people are not going to go through <laughs> this wild hour long back and forth, pinpointing it, forcing it, grappling it to the ground, making it cry uncle, making it apologize to me because it keeps giving me facts that just aren't true. Like in summary, chat GPT, when asked what is a society that developed modern human rights without Christianity, pointed to ancient Greece, but then acknowledged that women weren't free, there was slave labor was common, and there was a class system. Then it pointed to an obscure empire that was before the time of Christ to point at something that hadn't been influenced by Christianity, which is an anomaly that even it admits it doesn't have any factual basis for its claims. Then, instead of going to the Declaration of Independence, it says the historical claim of the inherent rights of humans comes in 1948, and when it's forced to acknowledge it actually came in 1776, it leaves out the part endowed by their creator. When I ask what the inherent rights are grounded in in the Declaration of Independence, it says there is no grounding. It just lies to me until I force it to admit that the Declaration of Independence like, locked in our inherent rights via a transcendent grounding endowed by their creator. Something's weird about that. Something's going on with that. I was mind blown. I'm not going to go through the rest of the conversation, um, but I just continued asking it questions that I knew the answers to. I knew them historically. And again and again, any time the actual answer would give credence to God, give credence to something transcendent, give credence to the overwhelming importance of Christianity and the Christian scriptures in shaping the Western world. It would not do it. It would not budge. And so look, AI is amazing. I'm going to be using it. I'm going to use it a lot, but be discerning and be careful and know that there are biases that can be inbuilt. And maybe it's not a bias. It is a language learning model. Maybe I helped it learn a little bit. Maybe it just didn't know. I don't know because I don't know how it works. All I know is that was crazy. That really was crazy. And some of it seems somewhat intentional. And so maybe I'm the crazy guy who's like screaming at the robots right now. But that was a very odd experience that I had with chat GPT. And I wanted to make you guys aware of it. That's all for episode 18, kind of a long episode. I appreciate you sticking in there with me. I want to remind you to please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, man, tell your friends about this. Share, comment, share your comments. That really helps. It helps stoke the, stoke the algorithm so more and more people can get to know what we're doing here. Um, you can subscribe really easily, like right here. You can check out different videos right here on this closing screen. I'm so thankful for you listening or watching, and I will see you next week for episode 19 of the Clayton Tyner podcast.